We're gathered here today to discuss grief. The movie we're talking about features a solitary, isolated brunette who lives alone with a beagle that brings joy to their simple life. When this beagle is killed, the brunette in question goes on a roaring rampage of revenge, culminating in an assault on the person they believe to be most directly responsible, before they head off into the metaphorical sunset toward an uncertain, but hopefully better future. I'm talking, of course, about Year of the Dog. Year of the Dog is a 2007 film written and directed by Mike White, who you probably know as That Guy from School of Rock, which is a masterpiece that he also wrote but did not direct. Year of the Dog is also scored by Christoph Beck, who has scored a very impressive list of things, but who, most importantly, scored a Cinderella story. Year of the Dog had only a limited theatrical release and is fairly unknown, continuing my trend of talking about movies that you've never heard of and did not see. This trend is projected to continue. I will be spoiling some major plot points of Year of the Dog, so if that is something you care about, you should go watch it first. As of recording, here is where you can watch it for free without having to resort to other means. And you can rent it for a few bucks pretty much anywhere that does digital rentals. Year of the Dog is, in its own way, a portrait of loss. A close look at grief and tragedy, and at how experiencing both can change you as a person. Tonally, Year of the Dog takes some obvious steps to give the film a very light-hearted feel. The scenes are warmly lit, the color palette is deliberately made up of bright, complementary colors. Christoph Beck's score is so wonderfully playful that I couldn't help but be endeared enough to buy it immediately after I saw the movie for the first time over ten years ago. But bright colors and a fun ukulele-laden score are like baby's first film class lesson when trying to set a really positive kind of tone, and neither of those choices are what I want to talk about today. In film, there's a standard you're expected to follow in shot composition when shooting dialogue, and I'm sure you've already heard of it. Shot. Reverse shot. Character A is speaking, and the camera watches them speak, sometimes from over the shoulder of the person they're speaking to, sometimes from a different angle further away, but pretty much always from slightly off to one side. When a reaction from character B needs to be shown, or when character A is finished talking, the shot is reversed. The reverse shot. And the same thing now happens from the other side. There are exceptions, obviously, when a director wants or needs to be more creative than the bare minimum requirement. These shots can be made more dynamic in a lot of ways, ranging from genuinely interesting to exhaustingly masturbatory, but the tried-and-true shot reverse shot is a standard for a reason. It's a simple, effective, and non-distracting way to have people talk to each other. It doesn't draw attention to itself. It's not super uncommon for a director to want to change up the shot reverse shot formula. It is, like with using your score and your color choices to set a tone, part of Baby's first film class in terms of directorial choices. But generally, again, not always, but generally, whenever a director deliberately changes up the shot reverse shot, it's done for artistic reasons. Shot reverse shot is standard, and if the dialogue sequence is long, this could get boring, so they want to give you something different to look at. Year of the Dog is not one of those movies. You won't find any artistically ambitious shot composition here, whether justified or obnoxious, because that's not the kind of story Mike White is trying to tell. The standard language of film is followed easily throughout, including in conversations, some of which follow the standard shot reverse shot. Some of which. Year of the Dog tells the story of Peggy Spade, played by Molly Shannon in a role written specifically for her. Peggy is an unassuming woman happily living an unassuming life. She works as a personal secretary, she has lunch with her friend. She visits her brother. She contentedly lives alone with her beagle, named Pencil. Ten minutes into the movie, Pencil refuses to come back inside after a nighttime bathroom break, and in the morning is found to have gotten into something poisonous. He dies. This tragedy forces Peggy to take stock of her life, including taking a harsh look at her interpersonal relationships. The things that she experiences after Pencil's death, and the decisions she makes in the wake of that tragedy, fundamentally change her as a person, and upon realizing that who she is now no longer fits into the routine of her old life, she leaves it, and the people in it, behind. Peggy has 53 conversations in Year of the Dog. Subtracting phone calls, which are shot normally because there's not too much you can do with a phone call when you're trying to stay simple, this count goes down to 48. Of these 48 conversations, 15 are presented in the traditional shot, reverse shot. Shot, reverse shot. The remaining 33, are shot like this, framing that is exactly, or almost exactly, straight ahead, sightlines that aren't over your shoulder or looking way off to one side. The characters aren't seated on opposite ends of the frame, looking across cuts at each other. They're seated at or near the center of the frame. 
and they're looking across cuts at you. When I watched Year of the Dog for the first time, this was something I noticed immediately. It's hard not to notice when it's so different from the standard that we've seen in every movie, in every show, since before we knew what the language of film really was. I chalked it up to an interesting creative decision made by the director of a unique film, but I didn't think about it too hard on my first time through. When I thought about the movie again over the next few days, in my memory all of the dialogue was shot like this. But then when I watched it again the next week, I realized that that wasn't the case, which made me take note of when dialogue is shot traditionally, and when it's not. Peggy is a woman who is continually taken for granted. People in her life don't talk with her, they talk at her, and she smiles and nods and affirms whatever they're saying, which is all that they wanted in the first place. When Peggy is in a conversation with somebody who is unable or unwilling to connect with her on a personal level, their conversation is shot like this. When she's in a conversation with someone who is able and is willing to connect with her on a personal level, who engages her in conversation rather than just using her as a yes man, their conversation is shot like this. A prime example that illustrates this very well is Peggy's interactions with her neighbor Al. The morning Pencil died, he was found in Al's backyard. That evening, Al comes by and offers the first genuine condolences that Peggy has heard all day, offering up that he had a dog as a child and was devastated by her death. He honestly and non-judgmentally engages with her grief, then relates to her through the shared loss of a beloved pet. He offers to take her out to dinner later in the week, and she says yes. This conversation, 17 minutes and 40 seconds into the runtime, is the first traditionally shot conversation in the movie. On their date, the traditional sightlines and shot, reverse shot framing are still here. But when Peggy asks Al how his childhood dog died, he casually explains that he unintentionally killed her in a hunting accident. Not registering Peggy's change in mood at this information, nor her distaste when she answers no to his question about whether she's ever been hunting, Al talks at length about the rush of it as Peggy looks more and more uncomfortable the longer he goes on. Al is no longer relating to Peggy. He's no longer speaking with Peggy. He's speaking at her. And sure enough, when they return home, their next conversation is back to that uncomfortable direct framing, and all of their future conversations are shot this way. Her boss, her neighbor, her best and maybe only friend, her brother, his wife, they all treat their relationships with Peggy entirely superficially, and the way their conversations with her are shot are an interesting but effective way to illustrate the distance that exists between Peggy and all the other people in her life. Al's ability and willingness to relate to Peggy on a personal level are fleeting and temporary, so the briefly traditional framing of their conversations quickly goes away. Of all the people in Peggy's life, only two of them consistently interact with her as a human being deserving of the consideration and attention that they themselves expect to receive. And because of this, only conversations with these two people are consistently shot with traditional shot reverse shot. The first is Newt, a fellow animal lover that volunteers with a local animal welfare organization, and the second is Lissy who's a child. Before Pencil's death, Peggy is content with the surface-level nature of her relationships, and she shows no real interest in fighting to get more respect and consideration than she's already afforded, which isn't much. Her boss, Robin, who considers money to be the most important thing in his life, and yet says things like this, Then maybe you need to start prioritizing people over money. Uses Peggy to reassure him that he deserves more money than he got dismissively referring to his ambiguously large bonus as a lot of money to you, but you don't have my degrees. Layla, her best slash only friend, talks in Peggy's general direction about wanting her boyfriend to propose to her. When she visits her brother and his wife, they spend the whole visit accusing their now former babysitter of giving their infant son Benadryl to put him to sleep. All of these conversations are effectively the same. A person comes to Peggy with a complaint, and Peggy reassures that person that they are in the right a smile, and a nod. In a normal two-way conversation, that person would now take their turn to ask Peggy about how things are going on her end. But they never do, and Peggy doesn't seem to expect them to. After Pencil dies, this doesn't change. Peggy, previously a passive participant in these conversations, has experienced something that demands the focus be shifted to her, and the people in her life are, again, either unable or unwilling to make that concession. Layla suggests things that she would enjoy, and when Peggy expresses disinterest, no attempt is made by Layla to even ask what Peggy does want to do. Robin offers her an early bonus, because that's what he would want. Money. When Peggy visits her brother Pierre and his wife Brett, their daughter Lissy shows genuine interest in why Peggy's sad, and Peggy honestly answers that Pencil died, which is immediately shut down because Lissy is, according to her parents, too young to learn about death. Then Brett, just like Layla, tries to comfort Peggy by suggesting they do something she wants to do, go to San Francisco to see Brett's sister and go shopping. 
Her facial expressions and body movements are obviously exaggerated and insincere, but Peggy, not picking up on the insincerity, says it sounds like fun and appears to mean this. When Al later offers the first sincere condolences that Peggy's heard all day, she seems almost surprised that someone would bother. When she later meets Newt, he quickly becomes the only person to consistently validate her feelings, engage her in conversations, and expand her worldview. She becomes more aware of animal welfare issues due to him, goes vegan, and tries to raise awareness of animal rights among her peers. Following this, as Peggy starts making these life changes that demand even the slightest bit of attention from those around her, she finds herself ignored, dismissed, and rebuked. While before she accepted this kind of disrespect in stride, the new Peggy retaliates. Robin chastises her for getting petition signatures at work. Peggy gets back at him for this by forging his signature on a check, stealing his money, and donating it to an animal welfare charity. When she doesn't get caught, because as his personal assistant she can screen his calls, she continues to do this for the rest of the movie. Her friend Layla's fiancé Don clearly has no intention of stopping his cheating or committing to marrying her. Peggy threatens him with her knowledge of his philandering to intimidate him into agreeing to adopt a dog with Layla. Towards the end of the movie, when Layla tells Peggy that things aren't working out with the dog, Peggy spitefully reveals that Don isn't faithful to her, though when Layla subverts Peggy's expectation that Don was the one who wanted to get rid of the dog by revealing that he's the one who actually wants to keep it, Peggy takes this revelation back and insists that she meant nothing by it. For Christmas, Peggy sponsors one rescued farm animal each for Peer, Brett, and Lissy. Peer and Brett make fun of her, clearly thinking that this is a silly gift, and dismiss her newfound veganism as just a weird phase. So Peggy takes Lissy on a field trip to visit the chicken she sponsored for her, and then pretends their next stop is a chicken processing plant up the road to see how chickens are killed for food. Unsurprisingly, Lissy refuses to eat meat after this, and her parents are absolutely furious. When Brett lies to Peggy about a fur jacket she owns, saying that she thought it was faux fur when she bought it and she feels terrible about owning it, implying that it's her only one when she actually owns several, Peggy soaks Brett's furs in the tub overnight, which ruins them, and then, sober in the morning, steals them to try and hide the evidence. While all of this is going on, Peggy's also spending time with Newt, who's helping her train her new dog, which is a rescue he brought to her named Valentine, but who has behavioral issues. Newt is well-meaning, but basically inept, and he has no idea what he's doing, which comes to a head when Valentine, being dog sat by Newt over New Year's while Peggy babysits Lissy, kills one of Newt's dogs, and Newt orders him euthanized. Peggy doesn't make it to the shelter in time to save him. Experiencing the loss of a pet all over again, she lies and says that she works for the LASPCA in order to adopt every dog set to be euthanized that day, eventually going home with 15 dogs. The chaos of the following night makes her late to work the next day, which means that she misses one of the charity calls she's been screening for Robin, and he learns that she's been using his money to donate to animal welfare causes in his name. She doesn't even seem sorry after she gets caught, mostly seeming disappointed in Robin that he would be angry about this at all when he fires her. Freed from having to go to work, Peggy lets her house descend into chaos. The dogs have free reign and quickly get to destroying the property. Back when she still had Valentine, Al had come over one night to complain about the barking, and Peggy directly accused him then of killing Pencil, whether through deliberate intent or malicious neglect. He comes over again at least a week after she got fired to complain about the chaos audibly happening within her home, and he ominously tells her that if she doesn't deal with the situation, he will deal with it for her. Newt calls her and is worried by her flat affect and the sound of what clearly sounds like more than the legal maximum of three dogs. Later, while she's out buying all the dog food on the planet, Newt comes to visit and sees the state of her home. Peggy returns home to a notice that all of the dogs have been seized. She furiously demands them back and threatens to sue if any of them are harmed, and then when the person on the other line refuses to tell her who knocked out her dog commune, she says she doesn't need them to confirm her suspicions because she already knows who's responsible. She assumes it was Al, unaware that Newt came by while she was out, and she goes next door to accuse him. He's not home, so she climbs over his backyard gate and starts rifling around in his garage. On their date at the beginning of the movie, she had briefly done the same, asking Al whether he had any bait or poisons in the garage, though her investigation got cut short when he tried to kiss her and she quickly left. This time, given plenty of time to investigate, Peggy finds a bag of snail bait that has been chewed through at the corner. This, it's clear, is exactly what killed Pencil. This, and Al by association, is the source of all her problems, at least in Peggy's own mind. When Pencil died, she tried to move on with Valentine. When she trusted Newt to take care of Valentine for just one night, he instead ended up having him euthanized, openly admitting to making the decision because he knew that Peggy would not. When she finally thinks that she's found peace in what is obviously an unhealthy living situation, but which nevertheless makes her some form of happy, that, 
too, is taken away from her. Once again, she thinks, by Al. This is the last straw. Peggy snaps. She breaks into Al's decorative knife case. We hear an extended version of Al's speech from the restaurant about hunting while Peggy lies in wait. When he returns home, she tries to kill him. She's obviously quickly disarmed and restrained, but she screams furiously as Al tells his girlfriend to call the police. Either later that night or a few nights later, Peer brings her to his home and exposits for us that she's unlikely to suffer any legal consequences because she didn't actually hurt anyone, and that Robin has agreed to give her back her job if she repays the money she stole from him for the donations. So she goes home. She goes back to work. She's expected to try and settle back into what her life was like before Pencil died. But after reading yet another animal welfare action alert, she writes a farewell email and leaves for good. We last see her on a bus, heading to a protest. Roll credits. When people show you who they are, the saying goes, believe them. The way people treat you after a personal tragedy shows you who they really are. It lays bare how important you are, or are not, to them. And sometimes, the unfortunate reckoning is realizing that the people in your life don't care about your problems, and they don't care about you. Before Pencil's death begins a sequence of events that radically change who Peggy is as a person, she lives a simple life. The film is non-judgmental of this, even as it shows that her only fulfilling relationship in her life is with her dog. Peggy may or may not be aware that her relationships with the people in her life are superficial. We don't know yet, but even if she is aware of it, she's unbothered by it. And that's okay. After meeting Newt, Peggy slowly starts to assert herself more in conversations, which, for as passive a conversationalist as Peggy, literally just means that she says something that pertains to her inner life rather than to the life of the person she's talking to. And even though these are minuscule attempts to force the people in her life to engage with her, she is still given no respect, no consideration. She tells Layla that she got a new dog. Layla, annoyed, tells Peggy that she'll never get a man if she keeps focusing on dogs. She suggests that her boss Robin adopts a dog. He ruthlessly and immediately shuts her down. She tells Peer and Brett that she's decided to become a vegan. Peer dismissively all but says he doesn't expect her to stick with it. While Peggy very quickly turns down Al's romantic advances and describes dating as yuck, she is not altogether a romantic. She shows romantic interest in Newt, but he gently turns her down. Another rejection in her eyes. Here is when we learn that Peggy was more aware of the superficial nature of her relationships than she seemed. And, maybe, they were superficial on purpose. Possibly for most of her life. I've always been disappointed by people. I've really only been able to count on my pets. I know it's pathetic, but it's enough. It was enough last month and last week, and it'll be enough next week. And because of you, I've really been able to acknowledge that part of my life in a deeper way. So, so thank you. Of course, Peggy isn't entirely blameless here. She steals money from her boss to donate to animal rights orgs. She convinces her brother's very young daughter to become a vegan, which, while admirable, was not her decision to make for a child that was not hers. She tries to kill Al, but each of these things was done as a retaliation for a slight. Peggy has been slighted many times before, and by all accounts, she never really reacted. Now, robbed of her source of solace through Pencil's death, she lashes out in ways that seem, perhaps, to be an overreaction. But there's really only so far that some people can be pushed before they refuse to be pushed any further. The problem Peggy ends up having with the people around her is just that they don't care enough. Not necessarily that they're bad people, just that they're not interested in the things that Peggy thinks are important, and they're not really interested in Peggy either. Layla's life is consumed by her relationship with Dawn, who clearly is not as invested in their relationship as she is. Robin makes no secret of the fact that money is the most important thing in his life, and so on. Newt makes the decision to have Valentine euthanized because he knows that Peggy would never have done it. Earlier, Newt told her that he could never kill an animal, but here, Peggy sees the very real limits of his commitment to that ideal. The old Peggy may have understood, but the new Peggy, for better or for worse, does not do things by half measures. Robbed of pencil, she tries to use her newfound causes to forge connections with the people around her, but those connections remain just out of reach, and the things that she does in that state of mind cost her her job. Had she been a little harder to disarm, they would have cost her her freedom and another man his life. In the end, Peggy's right back where she started, this time without any dogs, and she's given a clean slate to basically start over. But she can't bring herself to start over the way these people expect her to. She decides to dedicate herself to helping animals, leaving these people and their lives behind. I 
think that Year of the Dog does a great job of presenting Peggy's life to the audience as is, absent of any moral or character judgments. There's nothing wrong with being content living a simple life. Her simple life at the beginning of the movie isn't meant to be sad or pathetic, nor is her resolve at the end of the movie to give up everything and dedicate her life to helping animals, now living in practice a lifestyle that Newt himself couldn't or wouldn't, despite his own professed dedication to animal welfare. Let's say that Peggy, as she existed at the beginning of the movie, were to die in her sleep. While I don't doubt that there would be a funeral, a eulogy, some shedding of tears, and some degree of sadness, I feel pretty confident in saying that her death would, honestly, go by relatively unmourned. Pencil is the one who would be most affected by her death. It's Pencil who would miss her the most, and it's Pencil who would never be as happy as he was before she died. And while dying unmourned might seem sad, I really don't think that Peggy would have seen it that way. She prioritized Pencil over strengthening her existing relationships or fostering new ones, and she was at peace with that. It's really only when that peace is shattered by his death that she becomes visibly unhappy with where her life is at. I really wanted to have some kind of nice final thought to tie up this video, the way I got to a nice and tidy conclusion in my previous two. But I've been having a really hard time getting this script to flow smoothly past this point, and that difficulty demoralized me to the point that I didn't work on it for a couple of weeks after getting stuck a few paragraphs ago. The truth is, when I conceptualized this script and started writing it, I didn't really know exactly why Year of the Dog affected and continues to affect me in the way that it does. I mean, I try to source my meat ethically, I try to eat less beef, I don't eat meat every day or in every meal, but I'm not a vegan, I'm not a vegetarian, I've hunted in the past and I ate the animal that I harvested, and I'd actually love to personally source most or all of the meat I consume. So it's not like I relate directly to Peggy's quest to get the people around her to consider a diet and a life free of animal byproducts. I first saw Year of the Dog nearly 12 years ago. A decade is a very long time, and for better or for worse, I'm no longer the person that I was back then. But the parts of me that were affected by this little movie, a movie I really only looked for because I unironically loved Superstar and wanted to see what Molly Shannon was up to in those days, those parts of me are still there, still resonating with it, maybe even more strongly now than before as I myself get older. On websites like Post Secret, or maybe the more Gen Y relatable Fandom Secrets, it was very common back in the day to see secrets where people confessed that the only reason they were still alive was because they needed to know how Harry Potter would end. And not just Harry Potter, name any famous series written or otherwise, and someone somewhere has publicly or privately used that, and that alone, as their motivation to keep going. Whether any of those people transferred their motivation to something else when their series ran its course, I have no way to know, but the fact of the matter is that at least for a time, that singular external motivation is what kept some people alive. Mental illness is, as I'm sure will come as no surprise to you, heavily stigmatized in today's society. The mentally ill are demonized just as often as they're fetishized. People who choose to opt out of living are ridiculed as selfish or as cowards. People whose reason for staying alive, on the other hand, is considered juvenile or immature are themselves treated as childish or unsophisticated. Not to hashtag have problems on main, but like everyone else who creates content on the internet, I've been depressed for my entire conscious life. I can have and remember having had happy experiences. I have enjoyed and continue to enjoy things but I can't remember ever just being happy. When you're a kid, you don't really understand sadness. I was lucky enough to be put in therapy very young, and that did really help out quite a bit over the years. I didn't have a lot of friends growing up. Usually I had only one friend with whom I had a very intense friendship or no friends at all. But when I was 10, desperate for some form of consistent connection, I convinced my mom to let me get a pet. I wanted a dog, which she said would be too much money and too much work. She suggested a hamster, but I knew that they didn't live for very long. Eventually, we settled on getting me a bird. This bird. I wanted to name him Pidgeotto, but she vetoed that when she found out what it was, so I went with choice number two. Conrad Birdie, Birdie for short, named after the title character in my favorite movie musical. Birdie wasn't a family pet. He was my pet. And, soon enough, he was my friend. Sometimes my only friend, but always my best friend. Throughout the years, and especially in my teens, sometimes Birdie was the primary thing keeping me around. I couldn't go, because then who would take care of him as well as me? Who would love him as much as I do? Plenty of people would say, and in fact have said, that it's unhealthy to effectively put a potential expiration date on your motivation to keep living. But I think that if you're already in a state where you're looking for a reason in the first place, whatever gets you to the next day is reason enough. Peggy might not be in quite as drastic a state of mind as people who literally live their lives for their pets. Year of the Dog doesn't really say one way or the other. 
but she loves her dog. She loves animals, and through the events of the movie, her love for animals is what keeps her going when her life starts falling apart around her. Okay, so this, this is why Year of the Dog resonated with me so much ten years ago, and why it still resonates with me now. In media, characters who live for something external, something or someone outside themselves, they're seen as pathetic. Your motivation has to come from within, people will say. You have to want to keep going because life is worth living. If you can't find motivation in that, if you don't believe that, then you're weak, you're less than. If you stick around because your dog would be sad that you died, that's upsetting to know. It's uncomfortable. People don't like to hear it. Year of the Dog was the first movie I ever saw that non-judgmentally depicted a person whose purpose for living was external without turning around and then fetishizing or demonizing their struggle. Peggy herself is aware that her motivations are considered pathetic. I've always been disappointed by people, she says. I've really only been able to count on my pets. I know it's pathetic, but it's enough. But she's not portrayed as pathetic. Peggy lives for her pets, and later for her love of animals in general, and that's shown as just as valid a motivation as love for another person, for a child, for yourself. All of these are equally valid motivations to live, and none is inherently more deserving of recognition or praise than any other. Year of the Dog was the first movie I saw that said it was okay to have those kinds of external motivations. It said that some people wouldn't understand that kind of perspective on life, and it reminded me that it's not my job to make anybody understand. It's the first movie I saw that dealt, in some way, with these kinds of issues, but that also didn't judge me for having to live my life this way. I really don't know whether Mike White meant to make a movie with that kind of message. I think he was aware of it in his own way, considering how he talks about the process of writing this movie, even if he himself wasn't necessarily intending for me to give it the reading that I did. Just like with any piece of media, what you take from it is usually separate from whatever the creators may have intended, and at the end of the day, no one can take those internal experiences away from you. Just like whatever reason or reasons you might have for sticking around, that's for you to decide, for you to act on, and for you to know. There are so many kinds of life in this life. So many things to love. The love for a husband or a wife, a boyfriend or girlfriend, the love for children, the love for yourself, and even material things. This is my love. It's mine, and it fills me, and it, and it defines me, and it compels me on.